All right. Uh, there are various ways to make acoustic measurements in Pratt. Uh, in this video, we'll look at some of them using a sample recording that I made. Uh, one thing, this is a technology tutorial. It's supposed to help you uh, become more familiar with Pratt and how to use it. It's not an assignment walkthrough. I'm not going to be jumping up and down and saying, here's exactly how to answer a particular part of your assignment. You need to be able to connect the dots. But if you understand the material, I think this video will help you get where you need to be. Uh, so the first thing that often confuses people is that they want to click on a file and have it automatically open in Pratt. So here's uh, here's my uh, file browser and there's the file. If I just click on that, it's going to open up uh, an audio file. Okay. So that's the just the regular audio player. Uh, and, and that's usually what you want to automatically open up when you click on it. Now I could, uh, in my system, I can right click. There's often an open with some other application, a way to open it with some other application. I can force it to open with Prot that way. Uh, and here we go. It opens on my other window here, other desktop. So here's the Prot interface. Now the other way to open files is in Prot, go under open, read from file, and uh, find the file through the, the browser that it gets you there. Okay, so when you open something in Prot, any kind of object, it goes in the objects file. Uh, Prot isn't all that fancy, so um, when you get something, it's not going to be all graphically fancy, it's just going to put an entry in this objects list. Uh, they're numbered, and then the first word there is the type of object. This is a sound, and then the name comes from the name of the file. In this case, the file is roofing-hammer.wave, so roofing-hammer is the name that Pratt gives it. Uh, we're not going to look at this Pratt picture window uh, in this video, but it opens by default. Okay, so let's have a look at this sound. Select the object. It should automatically be selected if you just loaded it and then click the View and Edit button in the list of options to the right. And it'll come up with this file, this, this window, I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, when you're dealing with sound files, it's almost always really useful to, be, to listen to them as you analyze them. Uh, you can use these bars right at the bottom to listen to various portions of the sound object or to the whole thing. Notice that when I select a point, in the sound, I can listen to everything up to that point with this first bar. Or I could click the second bar and listen to everything after it. Uh, or I could listen to the whole thing with the uh, bar below. <clears throat> okay, the top portion of this window shows a waveform. That's a graph of pressure over time. Uh, the bottom, as you see, is blank. For older computers, uh, so that's supposed to be the spectrogram, and for older computers, spectrograms can take a lot of processing power. So by default, Pratt only shows spectrograms for shorter spans of time. So we could zoom in using the In button in the bottom left set here. These are the sort of zoom in, out to selection and whatnot. So if I zoom in, now I'm showing I've selected small enough uh, portion of the sound that it's willing to make the spectrogram. Uh, remember that a spectrogram has the same time dimension going left to right as the waveform, so it lines up with the waveform. But the vertical dimension for the spectrogram is frequency. Light areas indicate little or no sound energy at that frequency at that time, and dark areas indicate a lot of sound energy at that frequency at that time. So you can see the frequency scale on the left here from 0 to 5,000 hertz. So what we see here is that each stroke of the hammer generates a pulse of energy at all of the frequencies that are graphed here. Let's just listen to a little bit of this. Okay. <clears throat> now by default you'll be seeing these blue squiggles. I had them turned off so they didn't show up immediately. Uh, those blue squiggles are Pratt's attempt to 
automatically track the frequency. And it's important to note that although the track is overlaid on the spectrogram, it's on a different scale. The scale for the spectrogram, as we said, is on the left here, 0 to 5,000. The scale for the pitch tracking is on the right, from 75 hertz to 500 hertz. And you can change those in the, the settings, uh, the pitch settings there. Uh, so by default, pitch tracking is enabled, uh, but it is a very over-eager algorithm that tracks the pitch. Uh, it often hears pitch where there is none. So you need to know enough about your sounds to be able to judge whether Pratt is giving you good information or nonsense. So what's it telling me? Here in the middle of this hammer blow, it's telling me that the pitch of this sound is 292 hertz. What does this mean? Uh, that depends on the sound. If I judge that there, this is not a sound where pe pitch is meaningful, or I just want to get it out of the way, I can go to the pitch menu and just uncheck that first item, show pitch. Okay, and it goes away. Let's zoom in some more. Now you can select a particular part of the recording. I'm going to select about three hammer blows based on what I see in the waveform and the SEL button that zooms to selection. And you see now I have just those three hammer blows uh, visible. Now, if for some reason I wanted to know how much time there was between hammer blows, I could select the start of one hammer blow and then drag to the start of the next one. And maybe I overshoot it a little bit. That's okay. Uh, I can actually use the hold down shift and click near one of these boundaries to move it around, okay, to get myself a good, uh, you know, right right near the, the boundary that I want. Uh, now, at the top of the highlighted portion of the waveform, we have a bunch of numbers. In red, we have the start time and the end time of this selection. Uh, and get used to Pratt's insanely specific digits. The philosophy that Pratt seems to follow is that it'll give you the most mathematically precise numbers it can. It's not promising you that those are all significant and meaningful. That's for you to decide. A general rule of thumb that I use is that I find the smallest amount I can change it by. So I try to move the boundary by one pixel. Shift, click. So that's it. 5858 five, there. Oh, I didn't move it. Now it's at 5848. So it moved it by one one thousandth of a second, or about one millisecond. So at this resolution, at this zoom, one millisecond is about the, or the millisecond digit, that third digit after the decimal is about the most precise I can use. Everything beyond that, I'm going to ignore because that's a tenth the size of the smallest change that I can meaningfully make. So they're they're not meaningful. Okay. Between those red numbers, we have two other numbers. Uh, one in brackets with the unit and the other without. The one not in brackets is the duration. It's basically the end red number minus the beginning red number. That'll give you that number there. In this case, 0.273 uh, seconds, or 0.274, I guess, rounded, or 274 milliseconds. Uh, the other number is just what you get if you take one and you divide by that time, right? Uh, that's why it has divided by seconds. 3.654 per second. 3.654 of those uh, span, time spans, occur would occur every second. So you can imagine what that translates to in terms of the uh, sounds that we're interested in. Uh, I would call it a pseudo-frequency because the span you selected may not be the period of some regular cycle. Sometimes you just want a duration of something that isn't repeating. But if you want a duration of something that is repeating, that number is becomes more like a frequency. Okay, so based on, in this case, based on just these two pulses, I might say uh, that the hammer is hammering about three and a half strokes per second. Okay. Now let's look at the numbers to the left of the waveform graph, right? In the middle we have zero, and then there's a positive number and a negative number, and they're not exactly the same magnitude. Uh, these numbers are the largest 
and smallest pressure that's measured in the visible portion of the waveform. Here the smallest is negative 0.4637 and the positive is 0.4293. Okay, uh, so as a waveform the units, the, the vertical dimension is pressure. Uh, so the next question is what are the units there? Uh, and that's a good question. In this case they are just they, they aren't really given in units they're just a proportion of the maximum divergence from equilibrium that can be measured given the nature of this uh, digital waveform uh, we don't actually know what that maximum divergence is it'll vary from recording device to recording device and it depends on various settings that are in play at the time of the recording and that's okay because when we're measuring speech normally we're more interested in relative differences than absolute pressure if I select a point now, say in the tail of one of these pulses, let's go here, then I get a blue number on the left there. That's the pressure at that particular point in the wave, and because at this point it's below the equilibrium, it's a slightly negative number. All right, um, now, uh, the waveform automatically stretches and compresses uh, so that the maximum, the, the top and bottom here, is, like I said, the highest and lowest divergence in the selected section. So if I move along, or negative 0.4 and positive 0.4, if I move along, this one's a bit more, negative 0.66, positive 0.62, uh, and there's a bit of a gap. Oh, see in that gap, it become, the numbers become really small, negative 0.10, negative 0.07. And then I get to the next one, 0.5 and 0.6. This one's really extreme, negative 0.94, positive 0.85, you see. So as you scroll along, it'll scale uh, to that. Um, right. So you've got various ways uh, to, to look at a waveform in Pratt and the spectrogram and to pick out different uh, values out of that to give you an idea of the different acoustic properties of that wave. Now I'll leave it to you to use those views and those ways of selecting to pick out the numbers that are important to you for whatever task it is that's before you. Um, Pratt is a very powerful tool and it includes functions for making far more complex and interesting measurements than these. But I hope that with what you've learned in this video, you should be able to find all of the basic wave properties that you need to measure uh, and uh, go from there. So happy measuring.